So there wasn't any theft systems here. Um, this is kind of a fun thing. You know, how many of you, have you guys ever run afoul of an anti-theft system on a car? You ever had any experience? Like you had a, one that starts lighting off when you open the door and you're trying to figure out how to turn it off and all this kind of stuff. You had that before? Um, um, anti-theft systems have been around. When, when do you think they, the first anti-theft system was patented? For vehicles. I say late 90s. Late 90s, late 90s, late 90s, late 90s, late 80s. Yeah, I think it's back to the 80s. All right, we'll talk about it in a minute. I'm going to show you a, a little schematic in the patent papers for when the first one was patented. Uh, passive versus active. Passive anti theft keeps somebody from stealing the car. That's why, in other words, it's got the chip in the key usually or, that, or something like that. You know, I'll show you the variations in the older ones of those. Active anti-theft, which is perimeter anti-theft, means that you have to arm it, either by locking the doors or something. And what that does is supposed to keep people from stealing stuff out of the car. You know, like your box of eight-track tapes or whatever. You know what I'm saying? All right. So, one of the first, oldest anti-theft system, 1919. That's the oldest one. And so what the guy did was, this is pretty interesting the way the guy came up It's really interesting the way he came up with it. Because then there were nine switches in a box. And they were only accessible through little bitty holes with a special key. And so the switch positions were hidden from the thief. All right? And so when you leave the car, you can set whatever switches you want, like six, four, and maybe two. You know, just whichever ones are those old nine. You, you got to remember which ones you set them. I'll set that one, that one, and that one. And if he comes over here jacking around trying to turn other switches, you know, if, if he's flipping a switch, the one that's on, he's going to turn off, and his chance, he's not going to find the same ones that you did, you know what I mean? And so that becomes your combination, but you have to remember it. You know, if you don't remember it, and if he's come over here jacking around with it, and you're trying to get back in, you're going to be in a mess already because you have to, have to open it up and sell your switches, I guess, whatever. Well, anybody trying to steal a card and they know what switches you set, figure out what combination without seeing the switch position would be really impossible to miss the combination with disable the ignition system or maybe hold the ooga horn. You know, they don't want to do that. Now, more recent, in 1990, there was a module that's armed when the doors are locked with a key and a switch for each panel. This was a 1990 model. This is the one I like to show was on a, uh, a 90 model Eagle Talon that I worked on. This module right here won't talk to any scan tool. It won't store any codes. But basically what it does is once it's armed, it, it's basically going to, if any of these switches, this is driver door, passenger door, hatch, and hood. If any of these panels open, it's going to light off the horn and the light. Honk, 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 honk. You, know? you might notice this same little module is operating this through. Look at this schematic a little closer. All right, so there's your hood. There's your door switches. There's your hatch. And basically, you've got your daytime running light relay, which is a, you know, turns on the daytime running lights. It's one of the, that's what it flashes. This theft alarm control unit has got control over that relay. You might notice the power is coming down to the headlights, the headlight relay. See right here, your ignition switch turns that on. Your headlight relay, click, turns that on. Your headlight, is your headlights have power going to them all the time, and the headlight switch actually grounds the headlights which is kind of unusual because you're breaking the ground instead of the power to operate your headlights. Of course, you're breaking the power, but the headlights ain't going to come on until you turn on the headlight column switch. You know, this is the, per the switch on your thing. So that's going to send the ground up here. Well, if the theft alarm decides it wants to light off the alarm, and, you know, it can actually blow the horn and stuff too, but the, what it does is it turns that on like a like, you know, click, 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 and that provides a ground through that one. See there? And so that's how that basically worked. And so that, anyway, that's just a sort of an overview of that. I had one of these I worked on one time that, uh, and I've talked about this one in some of these other videos, that particular car. They said, this is a brand new car, still on the lot. Ever so often, the, uh, the, any theft will light off for three minutes, because it's got a three-minute time now. If it's just got a momentary, like if you open the hood and close it right quick, it'll light off for three minutes to run the thief off, make him leave. Now, this one here, something, was causing it to light off and light off, and like for three minutes it'd go honk, 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 and then it would shut up. And they said, brand new car still on the lot. Got to have it fixed before you can sell it to anybody. You can't sell somebody a car that's going to be honking to any theft and all. And so I built a little box 
uh, that power, and I powered up four little fuses that were like a fraction of an amp, and put little LEDs in there so that, and I hooked it up so that any, you know, right here in the module, right here at the module, because the module will obviously see on one of these ground. So I hooked it up, all four lights up to that thing, and whenever uh, I told the guys that were working late that night, I said, take the, don't bother this car if it lights off the alarm, but let me know if it did it. Next morning I came in one and said, yeah, it lit off the alarm last night about 7 o'clock. And I looked, and the hood switch was the one that had lit it off because it blew the little fuse I put in that box. You know, I just basically had to build something I got from parts of Radio Shack and put something together to make it. You know, you had to take a, you had to gather enough data so that you could take an intermittent problem, turn it into a hard fault. And a blown fuse would do that. And so I went and I ran another wire from here to here and took care of that problem. You know, on that particular one. But anyway, nope, the headlight switch in the daytime running light really provide ground to the headlight. Later models, this is a 1998 from Jeep Grand Cherokee. One of the benefits of them is the scan tool, when you connect it to the VCM, can tell you which one of these switches, and there's a lot of them, trigger, uh, you know, trigger the alarm the last time it triggered. Now, I will tell you this, the cylinder lock switch typically disarms it. See, disarm sense and all that. In other words, if you, any of those, if you stick a key in there and you turn it, you'll disarm it so that it won't. It. Vehicle theft security system, what they call VTSS. Something else that it does on those, on those Jeeps is it talks to the engine controller and if it's got vehicle theft security system on it and somebody lights this system off, it will actually not let the vehicle start. So they use that. Uh, whenever you armed that, it would also disable that. Now, the problem is, if you were doing a, you know, put an engine controller on there, for whatever reason, and you pushed in, uh, uh, if you told it that it had vehicle theft security system when you were setting it up, and it was a scan tool, and, you, and it doesn't have that, the vehicle would never start. <laughs> and you'd have to get another engine controller, because you couldn't back out of that. You know what I mean? It's just interesting how that went. I've seen people do that. They put vehicle theft security system, they feel like, I'll just switch it back, you know. One guy that I was working with did that, and they'd order another engine controller for it. Uh, of course, you got a hood switch, lift gauge and jar, lift gauge and jar switch, and all that. But like I say, if, let's say that lit off whenever it wasn't supposed to because something wrong. And you look at your scan tool, and you can say the last time the vehicle theft was, uh, uh, one was by the hatch or the, the tailgate or whatever, you know. That way you look at the circuit going back there, maybe the switch, whatever. Uh, cruise control on a lot of these vehicles now. The last time the cruise control was canceled, it was if it was a brake switch or if it was, you know, whatever. And that's pretty handy too, how they do that. Now here's an oddity thing. I was troubleshooting an expedition that was honking the horn and flashing the last intermittently in the rain. Honk, 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 you know. And they say, they said it was at another Ford dealership down there and the field service engineer from Ford came to help them with it because the people were so ticked off. He said they ran it through car washes and everything. They never could get it to do that. But every time it rained, it would do it. And so the, the field service engineer said to replace all of the door switches because he thought something might be wrong with one of those. And so as I got to investigate it, I found out that this one here, the Expedition in that year model, did not have perimeter anti-theft. All it had was you know, the passive anything. Uh, of course, it did have the box, but it was the one, that, the keyless entry box. You know, I'll show you much of that later. Explorers, which was a step down from this, it was a smaller vehicle, they had perimeter any theft and the other. So they had replaced all these door switches, and whenever they got by them in there, I found right down in this area, he opened the hood, looked down in there by the fuse box, out the blue wire that was going to the horn relay, I saw it was rubbing and I saw copper. And so that's all that was wrong with it. <laughs> but I mean, when it would get a little wet, it would make it easier to make contact, you see. But I mean, I, when you're looking for something in a minute, don't touch anything. Just look and see what you can see. Because if you start pulling on stuff, you're going to move whatever it is. You know? uh, once an attorney came to me and told me somebody had broken some windows in his 99 Grand Cherokee and took his laptop. Insurance company wanted to know why his anti theft system alarm didn't sound. But the OEM perimeter anti-theft doesn't have motion sensors like aftermarket systems do. You know, whenever you see, when you shake the car and they start lighting off, that's not factory. That's something somebody's put on there. It's kind of funny though, uh, I was uh, at the Craftsman truck race back in the 2004 or whenever it was. I went up there two or three, four times when I was going to the Power Stroke Rally. And uh, I was able to go into the hospitality booth up there because I was one of the people that was, you know, with motor age. And, uh, <laughs> I was walking on that cat, there's an elevator goes up, there's a catwalk that goes and 
You know, there's a building here in the parking lot with all those cars are out there. And when I was walking into that, getting ready to go into the hospitality booth, you know, where you can go in there and eat shrimp, and if you're somebody that likes beer, you can drink beer or whatever, and it's all free, you know. But uh, anyway, it was air conditioned too, it was hot that day. But the, the fireworks that they light off on the other side of the track out there, when they shot those fireworks off, those fireworks made such a loud boom that it lit off alarms in these cars out here. I mean, that shock wave moved those cars, and I could hear a, a bunch of alarms, honk, honk, honk. <laughs> I said, man, that was hey. a, it didn't it rattle your you know, cage, and it was a long way from the other side of that track to this parking lot, too. It totally amazed me, but anyway. Now, here's your Ford wrap module. Now, don't get the wrap module on a Ford confused with the wrap module on a Chevy product or GM. Because wrap on a Ford stands for remote anti-theft personality. That talks to your key fob, it talks to the buttons, you know, the buttons on the door, it lets you in. That's the box. They do that. Now, a lot of that, that box right there has got some numbers on it, typically, that look like five digit numbers. That tells you what that key code is, right? Tim, reach up and get that white box. Grab that, all right? Pass that around. Look at the numbers on that box. See them white, see them big numbers, that five digit number on that top box? You see a five-digit number on that label? What's that five-digit number? <laughs> Say it loud. Huh? 990204. Yeah. So anyway, if you see it typically, you'll see that. You see it. Oh, that one's, that label's had been torn. But there's a code. That, that big number right there, I gave you better. Give me another one. Give me that other one there. Yeah, yeah, I mean that one. All right, you see that number right there? See that number right there? That number right there is the one that's permanent code for that. The permanent code for your door buttons on that. Now back in the day when Ford Sports started doing that, they would put a sticker with that five digit number on the trunk hinge. So anybody walking by when you put in your groceries, they can see your permanent code. I don't know what in the world they were thinking about when they done that, but they stopped doing it and they started putting it here. Uh, but anyway. So what? Do that? Is, what if you change it? You well, change you, it. We, if so, that permanent code is always going to be there. But in order to change it, you put in a permanent code, then you push one, then you put in your new code. But your permanent code is always going to be good. Where is that located? Uh, wherever the box is. Like on a pickup truck, if you stick your head in the floorboard and look up into there, and it'll be up there by the park brake pedal. You'll see it, and you can see that code. You know, somebody was telling me, I've got a truck and I don't know what the code is. I just looked under there and told them what the code was, you know. I mean, he followed the truck. <laughs> but uh, now, I will tell you this, though. The uh, Crown Victorias have got the, the driver's door module that does its job. Crown Victorias also got a lighting control module that no other vehicle's got except Lincoln's. And it's a, you know, some in Lincoln car got it, the screwball thing, which is a different box it is. And then basically, you got your, uh, the gym module was what handled your, uh, fob functions on that. Back in the day, I was working on this Mustang one time, a 99 model, that you couldn't, the, the, the uh, fob wouldn't work. Turn the key on, f you know, five times, honk, honk, you know, push the fob and go honk, honk, and turn it off, turn it back. I mean, turn it off and the fob still wouldn't work. So I finally called the hotline and the guy said, oh yeah, you got to unplug fuse 10 or whatever it was. Leave it out for about 30 seconds, plug back then, it'll work. Well, I ain't wrote down nowhere. I'm not supposed to know that. You know what I'm saying? All right. But Mustang tended to use the gel module for that, but they're Incidentally, GM though stands for retained accessory power, which is a totally different, does a totally different job, but it's called a route module. So a route module on a Ford, a route module on a GM does a different job. So don't get no ideas about that. So passive any theft beginning early system on GM car, they got a discrete resistor pellet in the key. You've seen that on our old mobile key, haven't you? That little pellet. Now what there's a resistor in there's about 15 different values for that on the average. Some of them have eight, you know, the older models didn't have as many. But uh, if you, even if the key's cut right, if the resistor pellet doesn't have the same resistance as the, uh, as the right key, uh, then it's basically you're going to no crank out of that. Yeah, this has wired up. See, it goes in there and it makes a connection between those two wires and it's basically measuring the resistance right there. And you can actually set it up to recognize a new key. And so your connector under the dash, you get your lock cylinders, so your little key goes in there. You got white wires here. And what really likes to happen on those darn things is these wires like to break. You see that wire right there is broke? Those little white wires that come off that, that one there is busted. 
And this is what the replacement looks like, and it's got them wires coming off. You've got to go down there and put them in the right place on your module. And, uh, no crank situations. Also, those little contacts like to wear out where you're sliding that key in and out of there every time. All right, so next generation. 1993, European manufacturers started using a chip key or a little antenna hoop where you stuck the key in around the lock cell or triggers the key chip to transmit a number. Ford Taurus has got that in 1996. In Europe, that reduced car theft by 70%. A little chip in the key. Now, this is a sort of an antiquated one. Most of the keys now, even if you break the key apart, uh, like the ones I got for my, uh, like for my Explorer, this kind of key right here, there's nothing in that key you can see if you break it apart. The, the chip actually just looks like a piece of a plastic head of the key. Because I've took old keys that were being discarded and busted them apart. You won't actually find a chip in there that looks as dazzling as this one. You know, that one right there. So anyway, basically what you got there is your instrument cluster on that one. You got a passive uh, anti-theft thing, and it's, this one here basically will turn on the theft light. You see that theft light blinking? You see on a lot of these cars, you got, even when the car switched off, it blinking? That's just to let them know you got passive anti-theft. If you see that passive anti-theft light blinking really fast and the car won't crank or, or it starts to go dead, sometimes it is able to start then that doesn't necessarily mean you got a bad key or something else. You got this little antenna hoop right here, look at that module, and that basically, you know, does its number. Um, early Ford vehicles could be programmed with just one key. I bought that black uh, Crown Victoria that belonged to the college, and they had, had a whole bunch of keys made for it. They were all chip head keys, but they didn't have them uh, programmed. I had like eight keys for that darn thing when I bought the car, because it was a college car. And what I did was I took the two good keys, turn the first one on, turn it off, turn the second good key on, turn it off, stick one of those other keys in, turn it on, turn it off. When you do that, it's programmed. <laughs> but if you've lost your keys, then you need to go in there with a scan tool and erase all the keys and start over. You have a 10 minute timeout. As a matter of fact, I can show you guys how to do that with this IDS unit we got in that Crown Victoria over there. But those all tell scan tools will do that too. They'll go into the uh, passive anything else. Now, key on engine off with another good key, key on engine on with new key. You see a P1601 code or something like that, you know, you got key issues. You can also put a couple of quarters, hold a couple of quarters on either side of a key and turn it on. And if that doesn't, if the thing won't start then, you know, the transmitter and the key is not working as good as it should. Because that little antenna hoop puts out a little signal, wakes up that little chip, and it puts out a number. And if it doesn't recognize that number, it won't let the car start. Sometimes that's built in the instrument cluster. Sometimes it's built into the PCM. Sometimes it's built into a standalone module. So you got to find out where it is, you know. Um, some PAT systems will prevent starter operation. Some will say engine start. And they got the little various different lights. You know the little light that's on top of the dash on the Crown Vicky? that blinks and on my pickup, that's the any theft light on that. They don't have one on the dash on that one. Pickups have got it on the dash a lot of the time. My pickup's got one on top of the dash, my 07. And so, uh, but anyway, yeah, those you know, keys can be pretty. Now on the GM cars, they got a similar system. Uh, and they're, they're a little bit different, but the most common failure on a GM car is this thing right here. Or sometimes like on my, like on my son's 99, uh, Al Malibu he drove for a while. Uh, what happens on a GM car if that system doesn't have to use a security light? GM is nice enough to where they'll let you wait about 20 minutes and then you can start the car and go on, even if it's given a problem. You're not totally stranded, you just got to watch your watch for 20 minutes. So if you hear somebody saying, it won't start, security lights on, 20 minutes later it fires up, probably going to need an ignition switch. Because <laughs> it hasn't got that built into it. All right, and so the 20 minute wait, that's what it's all about. If, if, when a pass lock sensor fails or depth is detected, the fuel system disabled 20 minutes. You can look at your scan tool and go in there and see if it's vehicle theft, fuel disabled. If you see that, you'll know that's why it's not starting. You'll have fuel pressure. You know, but the, like that little uh, white pickup out there, it's got that system on it. That little white Chevrolet pickup we got, and it was giving trouble like that. Now, dongles, a lot of vehicles nowadays have dongles and push button starts. You know about that. You know, where you can just walk up to the door and go in the car, it's got a dongle in your pocket. Your detection area is out here. So you got an oscillator here. All right, you got an oscillator in the back for your trunk. You got an oscillator in the luggage compartment. Indoor electrical key oscillator. Uh, like on your Toyotas, you know, you'll have like one here, one here, and one in the back, and it's got to be in, in that triangle, you know, the Priuses and stuff. And so that's how that thing works. So you got a back door opener switch, uh, indoor electrical key oscillator, and those things can actually see that. One time I, I got in a car, some of these uh, Toyota cars, like Corollas and stuff, 
have a place where it looks like you're supposed to stick a key in there, but there's not a you, there's no hole in it. And when you got that fob, you can just start it up with this thing. It looks like it, you're supposed to, you know, it's real unusual. And I, I got in there, I had the fob in my pocket. And I had one of the dual enrollment students here. And I got in the car and I, I, I says, uh, okay, I want you to start for me. And so it started. And I got out and said, now you do that. He goes, what do you mean? I said, you got to talk to it. And he tried to start it. What more? says, talk to it. And he goes, okay, I want you to start for me. It didn't work. I said, you didn't say it right. Get out. So I got in there. Okay, I want you to start for me. <laughs> <laughs> and, that, and that guy says, this is one of those voice activated cars. I've never seen one of these before. <laughs> <laughs> he fell into that. <laughs> anyway, these things look like that. You'll see them, like a lot of times you, on a Prius, you'll see it sticking up there, funky little thing. That's an oscillator. That's what it is. Know what you're looking at. Right? It's a bug hunt story. It's a quickie. Nobody else that worked on the car. She went out one morning and started the bug and it just started and died. All right, we didn't have a VW compatible scan tool at that particular time. The other broke down, whatever. And so this light right here, they got to look like that's a key thing on a Volkswagen. It looked different. All right, there wasn't any of the mobilizer codes that came out though. But you get those, you don't get the mobilizer codes a lot of times on OD, on OBD2 generic, which is what we were using. We did get a crank sensor code that might cause this, right? Crank sensor, right? So the heart of the MO system is the instrument cluster. Because you have to be able to talk to the cluster on the VW if MO issues are suspected. All right, so we checked the spark. We found out it would start popping and it would go away while the engine was spinning. All right, then I picked the post, talked to the uh, Checking the AC voltage generated by the crank sensor. It was just less than 800 millivolts. It's supposed to be more than that. So we put a sensor on there and got the voltage up to 1,500 millivolts. That probably fixed the code, but it didn't fix the car. And chase that little rabbit for a little while. Furthermore, the Identifix guy told me, he says, it won't kill the spark. The, the immobilizer system won't kill the spark, it just kills the fuel. Well, that particular car he was wrong because it would kill the spark. All right, so I've got this VAGCOM cable from Joey Henry. That's the initial message we got from this cable right here. You'll get it to the PCM. You download this right here. You can get it from, yeah, that's a free download, but you got to have the cable. All right. And we wound up with this uh, powertrain data bus, missing message from instrument cluster. Now that right there was an interesting little uh, piece of uh, information there. All right, now with that software now, this is Ross Tech, uh, the cable I got from, we got to know which measuring block to select. It's a peculiar thing. It's not like any other scan tool. Uh, these were the first codes we got from the cluster. Incorrect key programming. So well, maybe we need a different key. So I had them to get me another key from the dealership in Pensacola, and they sent one up here. Still didn't do any good. And I said, I wonder if this is, you know, if this is Immobilizer 1 or 2, because it was a 2001. But the best tool to talk to it is a bag comp from Rostec. I didn't happen to have, so I bought one of those. I pulled the codes. If the problem turned out to be an Immobilizer, I'd be out of business if I couldn't extract the four-digit pin from the cluster, which you had to have to program the new key, or cluster if we had to have one. Well, we had a tool for that, too. Now, the customer, he told me, is usually what's wrong with these. That's what Joey told me. Okay. All right, so attempting to start the car, we got these codes. Immobilizer pickup coil, key signal too low. All right, the immobilizer pickup coil is one around the ignition switch. Well, I bought a salvage yard junk, uh, you know, uh, steering column. And it came with a key and all that kind of stuff. And we got that, and you know, it looked like it was in pretty good shape. Put it on there, you get a dang good thing out of it. So the switch pickup coil seemed like a logical possibility. Uh, we discovered that it had a serial number beyond the 430,000 bin threshold to separate from Mobilizer 2 from 3, but it was outfitted with Immobilizer 2, which didn't make any sense at all until later on. All right, so we got these codes from the engine controller, money to think it even further. Engine start blocked by Immobilizer, internal control module, processor fault intermittent, missing message from instrument cluster. You know, this is getting deeper. You know, I mean, we're still scratching on this. We got a replacement key and lock cylinder. We installed it, got the same result. And based on Joey's admonition about the cluster, we got a cluster because it couldn't see either one of the keys. So to get the pin from the cluster, we got another cable from Joey, another piece of software that looked like this. And uh, so we ordered a cluster. And he, asked, he said, is it automatic or standard trans? I said, it's automatic. So there's a permal stick in the floor, right? Put it on there. But this was one that didn't have an electronic automatic transmission. It had a doggone regular hydraulic automatic transmission. So when I put this cluster on there, it's throwing me code saying it doesn't see any transmission solenoids. So I got the number off the uh, cluster, said I need one with this part number, so he came up with one for that. Got the right cluster, still couldn't get, the, get it to take the key, because they, you know, 
and the key was okay. It's you know, measure measure box 21, 22, and 23, and the cluster indicated it was okay, but I hadn't received those results before. So I took the uh, keys apart, I mean the little head of that thing apart, and I taped the chip to that part of the key that would start the salvage yard thing, and it, and it, it programmed and fired up. We were good to go. You got to really stay into this, you know what I'm saying? Now, what the deal was, this is the one we got in the salvage yard. See how it's all busted up? The chip was ruined. I don't know how it could have got messed up as, as bulletproof as that thing's put together. And uh, when I was pulling that cover off of that, this one guy, Sean, was here. He said, when I was over in Iraq, we found a BMW emblem and put it on our Bradley and we started taking a lot of enemy fire because we thought we were the commander. <laughs> anyway, this is the one we bought with bad original key and chip. We put that one back in there, got everything back. End of the story was a replacement cluster with permanent fix. Now about a week later, he said everything's great, the car started okay, but the needle's waggling all over the place, so we had to get another instrument cluster. Had to, you had to hack the code out of the instrument cluster in order to get the uh, key programmed, because it's an anti-theft deal. Well, the, one of the maintenance men had a diesel that uh, Volkswagen was down at the diesel department, and they were in over their heads on it because they were trying to figure out why it'd start and die on that diesel. It turns off that little solenoid in the injector pump. And so I got it back up here and I, you know, figured out, you know, reprogrammed the key and all that stuff. And we had to put a solenoid in the injector pump and got that one started. So we used the same cable and the know-how on that one. Here you go. Be a terminator. Gather good data. Don't expect silver bullets. It's really nice whenever you can call somebody and they can say, tighten this screw and, you know, bend those two wires and everything will be great. It's already ever get that. This job now for slow thinking lazy folks. If you're bored in my class, you ought to go one of those five day manufacturer classes where you got to sit there all day long for four, for four and a half days. And then you got about a couple of hours in the shop, then you're good to go. You know what I mean? So, got to be tough, resilient, be really, really smart to do that kind of work. You're going to earn what you get paid, but that makes it all worthwhile. You feel better when you earn what you get paid, or when somebody just, or when you got a backup and they got to get you paid because you don't want to look them in the eye. You don't really want that, do you? You ever had a job where you felt like you had to back up with the guy to get your paycheck because he was paying you so good and you didn't do nothing for it? Ain't nobody really had one of them, have you? No, no. There ain't no job really like that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right.